This is Peter Helland on the show Israel. Of course, Israel is referring to Jesus and not the land in the Middle East. <clears throat> the church is called the Israel of God, and Jesus is the fulfillment of Jacob's turning to Israel, which is a type, <clears throat> and Jesus uh, being the true Israel is the fulfillment of Adam. Adam uh, was called to take dominion over the earth, and he was defeated by Satan through the woman, and that is why <clears throat> we're born in sin, and that is why we must die. But Jesus uh, saved us. Uh, if you look at Luke 24, it says, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And up till that point, nobody had seen the scriptures. Everybody was blind. They were born in sin and they were blind to the scriptures all the way up till Christ and all the way up to the point that after his resurrection, at the very end of the 40 days, it looks like, um, he then opened their understanding to the scriptures so that they knew what the truth was and what they must do. And of course, that's the question today. What should we do? Well, first, you got to have the truth. And the truth, Jesus said, is this is what the scriptures say. This is the summary of the scriptures. And in a sense, uh, you could argue perhaps you don't need to read the scripture. The scriptures were written to bring you to Christ. What you need is Christ. And it says here, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning in Jerusalem. So what should we do? After you have your understanding by Christ opened up, that the Old Testament is about the gospel, and the gospel, St. Paul said, is the suffering of the Messiah, dying for our sins, the resurrection of Christ on the third day, according to Scripture. And once you get that revelation, then you know what you must do. You must repent. The word repentant is metanoia. You must change your mind, fundamentally change your mind, and don't have a Jewish mindset toward the Old, Old Testament Scriptures. They thought it was, going to, it was about the restoration of the nation of Israel. And now we have this whole country called America. Whether it's a country is another question, but it's a landmass. It's called the, an experiment, maybe an experiment in a non-country. Who knows? Countries up till America were all one ethnicity. We completely broke the mold at every point. So all definitions with America are turned on their head. And if we don't come to realize that, you're going to accept some of these definitions that come at you, and they are a reversal of what that definition had been for thousands of years. The word country, the word nation, we turned the definition on its head. The word nation means ethnos. What ethnos are we? So we are called to repent. And repent means to change your mind, men annoy you. Change your mind about what the scriptures are saying. It's not about the restoration of the nation of Israel. It's about the suffering of the Messiah and him rising on the third day. And that was, his death was our death to sin and his resurrection was our resurrection. And now it says we sit with Christ on this very, right after he said this, on that day he was ascended up in, to heaven to sit at the right hand of God. He was then called the Lord and Christ, Acts chapter 2, and we sit with him in the heavenly places. This is our salvation. But that repentance, we must repent of our individual sins. That's the, the whole gamut of sin. The word sin, of course, has lost its meaning today, especially in this country. But you're going to have to recover the original notion of what that word sin means. But it wasn't, it wasn't only individual sins, it was the sins of your fathers. Sins of the fathers was crucial. It's in the Old Testament, all throughout the Old Testament. Whenever they had to repent, it was of individual sins and of their sins of their fathers. 
The Ten Commandments says, God punishes the sins of the fathers, even down to the third and fourth generation. So generation could be 40 years, maybe 70 years, but it almost takes us back to the, uh, let's say it's 70 times four, that'd be 280 years. It takes us all the way back to the beginning of this country. So we certainly have to repent of the sins of the founders of this country. You think they were without sin? We have the 4th of July coming up. And have we ever heard the argument against uh, the American Revolution? Uh, when they repented in the Old Testament, it was sackcloth and ashes. And, and uh, if you analyze the 4th of July, you may conclude that you should be in sackcloth and ashes on the 4th of July. When uh, the American Revolution started, and it started over the Boston Tea Party. Uh, the, I think it was the Ind East India Company had sent their tea here. And supposedly the, uh, the Masonic Lodge there in Boston, they dressed up as Indians, come out of the Masonic Lodge, and they went out and destroyed all the tea. Now, these, the uh, people that owned that tea had paid taxes and the king had a duty to protect them from these uh, thieves and masons and, and uh, sons of liberty. So the king had no choice but to come to their rescue and uh, capture and apprehend uh, the villains. And of course, when the king did that, uh, he, he was considered very evil. Uh, John Fletcher writes in here, American patriotism further confronted with reason, scripture, and the Constitution. He makes a parallel. He says, yeah, that would be like you're going to blame the king for trying to do his duty to the taxpayers. He, had a, he owed a duty to him to, to uh, catch the sons of liberties who destroyed all the property that belonged to the, uh, this company. And he says that would be like saying that, that when Adam and Eve ate the fruit off the tree, it wasn't their fault. It had to be God's fault. I mean, why did he make that law? You know, if he hadn't made that law, you, sh you can't eat the fruit off that tree, uh, then they wouldn't be guilty. So it's God's fault. Well, now you're figuring out how Americans think here because we got it all backwards. So Fletcher... Um, <clears throat> Uh, he was the successor to John Wesley. Wesley started the Methodist Church, became the biggest church in America for a long time. And Fletcher uh, was responding to Thomas Paine, who wrote Common Sense in 1776, 75. Fletcher, uh, Wesley wrote uh, an address to the American colonies. And um, uh, uh, Wesley wrote uh, um, the address to the American colonies, a calm address, and basically said that Americans are just trying to be free from God's law. And the idea that they don't have to pay tax is ridiculous. We, uh, the king spent seven years fighting the, the French and Indians to, liber to, to keep the American colonies free from French dominion. And he built up uh, the debt the British accumulated in large part because of that war. The king said, and parliament said, we have to finally tax the Americans. They hadn't been taxed, basically. And the Americans said, we don't want to be taxed at all. We want to be the only nation in the history of the world that doesn't get taxed. And uh, that's not too realistic. And so um, they blasted Wesley for what he wrote. And then Fletcher jumps in and writes, uh, this is all at the same time, 1776. This, all these things are being written. And Fletcher writes a vindication of Reverend Mr. Wesley's calm address. And that wasn't enough. So then he writes an a, a, um, 80 page book, American Patriotism, farther confronted with reason, scripture, and the Constitution. Observations on the dangerous politics taught by Mr. Evans and Dr. Price, with a scriptural plea for the revolted colonies. So they're still trying to get the colonists to wake up. Wesley said this whole thing was hatched in England by the evil uh, Price and Evans and some evil theologians whose theology was completely off the wall. And the Americans were drinking the Kool-Aid. They were drinking it and drinking it. And Wesley was hoping to stop it. 
but and hundreds of thousands of tracts and, and pamphlets were being sent over to America to try to get the Americans to wake up. The blockade stopped it. In, the English people did read them, and um, the result is that that didn't happen in England. England was spared a huge revolt, but the revolt boomeranged from America, not to England, it boomeranged to France, which is amazing. So France got the uh, church plant. I call it a church plant. The, camp, we, the church was created, and I'm using the word church facetiously, but this experiment was planted first in America, and then France uh, became uh, the second one with Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, James Monroe. A lot of Americans went over there to help assist that, you know, Benjamin Franklin. And um, the, the evil of it was is that the American churches then internalized these principles of the American Revolution. And Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the uh, Pharisees, the leaven of the Sadducees, and the leaven of Herod. And that meant teaching, the word leaven. So it's the leaven of Herod that we should be watch out. Don't let the government forces uh, affect my teaching, Jesus is saying. My teaching needs to be pure and holy. My word is holy. Don't let uh, my scripture be twisted. And St. Peter said it uh, specifically. He said some of the uh, teachings of St. Paul are hard to understand, which the unlearned and the unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So it's very possible to twist the scripture to your own destruction. Very possible. And if you don't safeguard yourself against that, you will be swept away. Um, how, would, how was that phrased? It's, it's, I think it's very significant. Uh, in 2 Peter, we can read that. And the, the way it, it, it said, um, You therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. And he's talking about Saint, uh, how easy it is to twist the scripture to your own destruction. And um, we're going to lean heavily on 1 Timothy. And I think 1 Timothy says the same thing here at the end of uh, chapter 6. It says, um, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. And not only that, uh, chapter 6 can, has the, the phrase, uh, but they that will be rich. He says, having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So, it's easy to shipwreck yourself, very easy. And America is a country that makes it even easier, as we will see here. Let's look at uh, the main argument, the main reason that the American experiment is so dangerous. And that maybe on the 4th of July, you might want to consider uh, sackcloth and ashes. Now here's, here's why, here's Fletcher uh, in his book, American Patriotism Further Confronted, explaining uh, that these principles, um, he actually compared them to uh, uh, satanic principles, which is interesting because um, you remember this, remember that incident that happened a couple of years ago? Uh, I, it, was either, it was in the House of Legislature or it was in our Senate in Washington, D.C. And the stenographer, I think it was, was so burdened uh, day and night how evil this country was that she felt she had to say something. So she's the stenographer there in the, in the, um, the Senate, let's say. And so when she saw us, the, the podium was vacant and the place was kind of full, she took her chance and she walked right over to the podium and she addressed the whole Senate. And she says, this country was started by Masons, we're following Masonic principles and we all need to repent. 
Of course, they hauled her to the nut house, okay? And you heard nothing more after that. Well, it's your job to find out, was this country started on Masonic principles? Fletcher said, not only was it started on Masonic principles, um, I had a fella on the show here. He was a classmate of my dad, Paul Fisher. And he was on the show. Um, and he wrote a book, Behind the Lodge Door, uh, a big, nice big book, uh, showing that all the Supreme Court justices from 1941 to about 1971, the majority were Freemasons. And then he wrote about a 90-page book uh, called Their God is the Devil, saying, uh, establishing from Catholic documents that, that, that ever since about 1730, the Catholic Church has consistently always said the Masons worship Satan. Well, if this country was founded on a union between Method, uh, Presbyterians and Masons with the common motto that rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God, and Franklin wanted that to be on our coin, uh, is it possible that, that, that the very principles that Satan argued uh, to, to lure the other angels into rebellion, his arguments of freedom and slavery, which were the common themes uh, the American Revolution, freedom and slavery. Uh, let's, let's just read how Fletcher lays this out. Um, so Fletcher is arguing against uh, these theologians in England, Price and Evans. And um, so he fights back, you know, they're arguing back, they're writing letters. This is 1775, 1776. And Fletcher, uh, let's, let's listen to the, uh, the argument here and see if we haven't drank the Kool-Aid of the leaven of Herod and completely anti-Christian principles laid at the foundation of this country. And if we remember, Jesus was extremely concerned about the foundation uh, of buildings and the foundation of theological thought. So Fletcher writes, the plausibility of this argument rests upon the following mistakes. Okay, These are the mistakes in their thinking, Fletcher's pointing out. You still suppose that insisting on moderate taxes as a reasonable equivalent for protection is a species of robbery. This is, don't forget, this was about taxation without representation. That you know, the, the British had no right to tax the, the American colonies, which hadn't been basically taxed at all. First time in the history of the world, maybe. And finally, it, because they saved them from the French, the Parliament insisted, we got to tax them to help recover our debt. Um, you still suppose that insisting on moderate taxes as a reasonable equivalent for protection is a species of robbery, whereas such a demand by the consent of all men except the patriots of the day is as reasonable as the demand of a moderate fee which a diligent lawyer has upon his client. Um, point two, you do not consider that the colonists being indirectly represented in Parliament have as much have as much consented by their indirect representatives to pay taxes to the parliament as the patriots and you have consented by your direct representatives to be additionally taxed in order to bring the colonies to reason. The Latin word servus means not only a servant, but a bondman and a slave. And the English word servitude means both slavery and the state of a servant. But would it be right in me to avail myself of this analogy to put to put all the patriotic servants in the kingdom out of conceit with their servitude and to make them shake off the yoke of, into, of dependence under pretense that servitude is ad, abject slavery, whether a servant is treated well or ill. In Hebrew, the word obed, servant, means both a slave and a subject. Now, to trace that word obed, that's, that's the word that's commonly used in the Old Testament. It was actually used in Genesis 2, 15, where it's God... Told, uh, commissioned Adam to tend the garden and to till the garden. For Adam to till the garden is the word uh, obed, or abed, you can say sometimes, and it meant to work as a slave. Adam was God's slave, and the proof he was a slave was the command. If you eat the fruit off that tree, you will die the day you eat it. That was proof he was a slave. He had to obey or he'd die. Okay? I mean, we're getting definitions of slave. People use the word slave. Well, what's, what's the bottom line? What is the core definition of a slave? 
Um, so he... Uh, so he writes, an abject slave is bound to submit himself reasonably or unreasonably to his lawless sovereign. He's writing to Price. A loyal subject is bound to submit himself reasonably to his lawful sovereign. And therefore, as they are both bound to submit or subject themselves to their sovereign, they are both abject slaves. That was Price. Fletcher writes to Price, such logic, sir, may convert he heated Americans to your overdoing patriotism. But if I am not mistaken, it will confirm judicious Britons in their constitutional loyalty. Constitutional loyalty. You conclude your argument by saying, a slave is equally a slave when treated well as when treated ill. And you might have, and you might have added, a subject is equally a subject when treated well as when treated ill. But then, but then the pill would not have been properly gilded, and your own loyalty as well as piety would have taken the alarm at a doctrine which bears so hard upon this gospel precept, let every soul be subject to higher powers. For my part, whatever you may say of my meanness, I will be the servant, the subject, if you please, sir, the slave of good government. I am determined to glory in the subjection of which you seem to be so afraid and ashamed. Apply this to wives to husbands. Apply this to children to parents. You know, Fletcher's going to say, I glory in my submission. Adam should have gloried in his submission to God and told the serpent and, and said, you know, like Jesus said to Peter, Satan, get behind me. That's what Adam should have said. Satan, get behind me. He should have gloried in his being a slave to God. But, but the devil's argument got to him. And applying to a free man what the apostle says of a son, I do not scruple to assert that a free man, so long as he lives in society and is a subject, differeth nothing from a servant or slave who is well treated, but is under governors until the time appointed of his heavenly father for his removing from earth and leaving the society of mortals. To oppose this doctrine, Fletcher writes, is to overthrow subjection and government which stand or fall together. So the issue of the war, they kept saying, well, even if you have a good... Uh, Governor, even if your husband is the best husband, the fact that you have to obey him makes you a slave. Or the slave to the master. You could have the best master imaginable, but the fact that you're a slave and you have to make you an abject slave, the worst thing possible for a human being. Yeah, but they fail to look at Adam. And that is the cause of most everything. We fail to see who Adam is. Just like if you fail to see who Jesus is, you're lost. You can't be saved. Salvation depends on you seeing Jesus. As many as uh, uh, Jesus said, as Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness, and those who looked were saved. Salvation is looking to Christ, apprehending him, and receiving him. But you also have to look to Adam. You have to know who you are in both directions, from behind from Adam to Christ ahead. And Fletcher uh, places most of his argument on, the, on the Ameri uh, why the colonists were wrong in the revolution on Adam. And he writes here, a word about the origin of power. I believe with St. Paul that the powers that are, are ordained of God, who is the fountain of all power and the author of all good government. I, I date the divine communication of power from the parasitical age, age of paradise, Yea, from the hour in which God said to Adam and Eve, multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over every living thing. Here, sir, is the original grant of power. And whosoever wantingly resists the power which providence calls him to obey breaks this great political charter of God, which is so strongly and so frequently confirmed in the gospel. Now, Price had an argument. Price was saying, so what? When Adam died, that, that authority in Adam was equally spread to all fathers on the earth. Nobody had a particular um, power over anybody else. It was all equally shared, and that's where you get the radical democracy. See, we're, we're living in radical democracy. Everything is equal, equal. Remember Lincoln? Quotes the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, and then Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address he says, this nation, we are dedicated as a people. We are dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. 
And if you look at the arguments for same-sex marriage, they argued off the Declaration of Independence. They argued off the Gettysburg Address. So this is what Fletcher was fighting against. So in the beginning, this thing was heading straight to sodomy. Straight to sodomy. And uh, if you want to get the scriptural basis for it, you can go right to Genesis 18. Genesis 18, 19. God says to Abraham, For I know him, Abraham, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. So the contrast is very clear. The godly person commands his household, commands his wife, and the ungodly household does not have the father command his wife or command his children. And why is it critical that the man command his wife and command his children? And the, the opposite pattern is you'll head straight to Sodom and Gomorrah. It's critical because if you go to um, Genesis um, chapter 2 and 3 and 4, uh, it says God created the woman to be man's helper. And at first he tried to find a helper amongst the animals. That failed. He put Adam to sleep and created the helper uh, from his rib. She, and the, his helper uh, became, uh, uh, the, the woman became his helper. King James uh, 1611 says, help meet. And the devils used that King James word, help meet. And we have internalized the word from that, help mate which means partner, and we've used that to think marriage is 50-50 so that we align ourselves with Lincoln's proposition that all men are created equal. So everything has to submit to the doctrine of Herod. The leaven of Herod, the whole church has to submit to Herod's doctrine, the political doctrine of the day, which basically comes from Declaration of Independence, which Fletcher blasts, and Lincoln sustained in the Gettysburg Address. And all have to, we all have to bow to that false god. And uh, to the point that if a husband even uh, yells at his wife, she can take him to court and, and, and uh, put him under punishment. But chapter 3 of Genesis lays it out. The punishment comes upon the woman. And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. This kept women, uh, uh, until, the American, uh, until after the American Civil War, this kept the marriage relationship uh, workable. Because everybody believed that. And he shall rule over thee. But after the Civil War, they knocked that scripture out. It was gone. And uh, the problem with that is that scripture, in thy desire, is only in the Old Testament three times. The second time is in the next chapter. And God says to Cain, and unto thee shall be sin's desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So sin is, is desiring Cain. The woman is desiring Adam because of the curse. She's now going to desire. She's not going to be content. And she's going to want to usurp her husband. That's part of the thorns and thistle. That's part of the curse. And God told Cain, sin is desiring you, Cain, and you better rule it. And God tells uh, the man, the woman will be desiring to rule you, man. Of course, it's you know, Satan using the woman, perhaps you could say. And, but the man has a duty to rule the woman. And Cain failed to rule its sin, and he ends up killing Abel, and he's cursed. And if the man fails to rule the woman which you could almost argue is almost his fundamental mission on the earth. I mean, to say it bluntly, the man's fundamental mission is to rule the woman. And if he fails to rule the woman, as Cain failed to rule sin, then you can expect unbelievable disaster, basically heading for Sodom and Gomorrah. Because even on a psychological level, sodomy is a result of a weak father failing to rule the, failing to rule the wife. And if, you, and if you grow up in a home where you have a weak father, he can't rule his own, his own wife, the kid is uh, he's a disaster. Okay, He'll be a disaster. 
And I was looking at Malachi chapter 1, verse 6, and it says, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Uh, in the Catholic Bible, the Douay, Douay, Douay Reims version, I think it was back in 1590, they got the translation right. King James got it wrong. I hate to, I hate to be blunt. Uh, it says wives are to phobia their husbands. It's about nine, 90 times in the New Testament, phobia. It's always translated fear. King James, for whatever reason, decides to translate it, wives should reverence their husband. Wives are to fear their husband. If I be the master, where is my fear? Sarah called Abraham master. Up to the Civil War, women did not call their husbands by the first name. It was a, that would be a great disrespect. Just like children calling their parents by their first name. Great disrespect. Where's my fear? And that is what was lost at the American Revolution. John, uh, the critique on John Locke was Locke, uh, they said, well, it was John Locke's treatise on government that was at the essence of the American experiment. Well, Gordon S. Wood out of Brown wrote, the, the how radical, he wrote a book on how radical the American Revolution was. He says, no. John Adams said the revolution was already over before the first shot. He said the revolution was in the family. We decided that these relationships where the master says, where's my fear? We got rid of the fear. We replaced it with this notion of love. So we have all these people preaching love and they have no idea what it is. It's just secular notion of love, not a biblical notion. So, um, so, he, so Fletcher takes it back to Adam yet, and um, he's arguing with Price. And this, is a, this, is, this is the key notion here, because everybody up till America, when they said we believe in the divine right of kings, you got to understand, we get misled by that. Adam was the, was the mediation. God gave his authority to Adam. And, of course, in a sense, Adam lost that authority by eating the fruit. And Jesus, is the last Adam, second Adam is sometimes, uh, restored that authority back. And Price says, yeah, Adam had the authority. And, and then it just went equally to all fathers. And let's look at that argument. Fletcher uh, quotes Price. You reply on page 74, the first man could have no power to protect and rule mankind till there was some for him to rule. Um, that was a bogus argument. He said, you know, there was nobody to rule, so how could he have been given authority to rule? He, he blows that away. But then he says, but you add on page 75, when Adam became a father, he had as much power as any other father. And page 77, you ask, does not every father receive the same divine right of dominion? See, this is radical democracy. Everybody's equal. Nobody has a right to rule over anybody above anybody else. The husband has no right to rule his wife. And ultimately, I guess they don't have a right to rule their children. You know, nobody has a right to tell anybody what to do. Um, Fletcher writes the, the price. You asked, does not every father receive the same divine right of dominion? asserting that, quote, there is nothing to be inferred from the parental authority of Adam, but is equally applicable to all parents without exception. Fletcher says, I reply that it is contrary to all divinity to say that every parent is endued with all the authority which Adam was invested with when God said to him, subdue the earth and have dominion. You are too judicious a divine not to speak a different language in the pulpit. You know, sir, that Adam was invested with characters which he could not communicate to all his posterity, and which consequently are not common to all men. A simile will possibly convince you of your mistake. King George III is with respect to his children what Adam was with respect to his posterity. He is a, the king is a father, King George is a father and a king. The first character he can entail upon all his sons, but the second he can entail upon none but the Prince of Wales. This shows the inconclusiveness of the argument you draw from Eve's motherhood and the petticoat government. He goes on. Um, you tr and then he, uh, skipping here, and then he says to uh, Fletcher, uh, writing to Price, you try to embarrass the question by saying 
uh, you must tell us who is Adam's heir. What does it signify what power Adam had or what power he left behind to his governing successors unless we certainly know who those successors are? But I reply, and this comes to the crux of the matter, who inherits Adam's authority? Now, we live in, a, in an experiment. Part of the American experiment was to destroy uh, Christianity, the Christian tradition, that when the father died, the oldest son basically took the father's position. That was the rule throughout, I think it was especially since uh, William the Conqueror, maybe uh, 1066, it was, became part of the law. Because that's what you're supposed to do. The oldest son has a special place. And when a king died in England, the Prince of Wales, the oldest son took the king's place. Not every son had became the king. This goes back to Adam. And if we don't understand this, we're going to be lost. And when, when a father dies in our culture, what happens? Does the oldest son take over like they always used to? No. So guess who wins? The lawyers win because it becomes a contest. It becomes a battle. And the lawyers get one third. And they love it this way because they set the laws up. Um, so a price says, well, then who, who, who takes Adam's place? Who got his power? And Pletcher, Pletcher, Pletcher writes, but I reply that in every country, those who share in the dominion given to Adam and Eve in their regal capacity are as much known as the king and parliament are known in England, the Daga and Senate at Venice, the emperor and diet in Germany, the monarch in France, and the despot in Prussia. Whoever by the good providence of God is endued with the legislative and protective power in the country where I reside and retains that power by the consent of a majority of the people is the higher power which I consider as actually ordained of God for my protection. To that power I will cheerfully submit so far as it is used for good and to that power I will conscientiously pay taxes for the protection which I enjoy. But the basis of that authority comes from Adam. And once you destroy Adam, which Locke basically, I've said this before, Locke, John Locke basically cut Adam in half. And with the Civil War in this country and Charles Darwin, Adam doesn't exist in this country. There isn't, he is such a myth, he's equal to a Santa Claus for most Americans, and especially here at Notre Dame. Notre Dame leads the way of promoting theistic evolution. It was almost invented at Notre Dame and it's conquered the Catholic Church. So Adam has as much reality to, uh, to a typical Catholic as Santa Claus does. Because Adam is not considered real. It's a myth. So how real, uh, is, how, can, how real can Adam be if you think he doesn't exist? What kind of game are you playing? And that's the game they're forcing us to play. And you will lose. Um, so then we go... Uh, and he, he skips and he goes on to another aspect of Adam. Pass we on to his doctrine, Price's doctrine, concerning the origin of power. So this is a second, uh, second attempt to address the issue of Adam. I am sensible, this is uh, Price, I am sensible that all I have been saying would be very absurd were the opinions just, which some have maintained concerning the origin of government. According to these opinions, this is Price talking, government is not the creature of the people or the result of a convention between them and their rulers. But there are certain men who possess in themselves, independently on the will of the people, a right of governing them, which they derive from the deity, which is what they call the divine right of kings. From this quotation, Fletcher writes, it is evident that according to Dr. Price's principles and your own, that's Evans also, government is the creature of the people. Fletcher writes, in full opposition to this doctrine, I assert that government is the creature of God. It is as, a, as absurd to say that government is the creature of the people as to maintain that religion and marriage are the creatures of the people. He goes, um, when God said, I will make man and help meet for him and joined Adam and Eve together in their human capacity, bidding them increase and multiply, he instituted marriage. And when he said to them in their regal capacity, have dominion, he delegated governing, 
governing power and instituted government on earth. Um, and if this is the case, is not Dr. Price under a, ca a capital mistake when he makes government the creature of the people? So where's the key here? When God told Adam and Eve, and when he said to them in their regal, kingly capacity, he said, have dominion. God told Adam and Eve, rule the earth. And when Adam died, that ability to rule was passed on down. Genesis 10, they were, uh, Noah had three sons, Shem, where you get the word anti-Semite, Shem, Japheth, and um, Ham. Ham uh, looked upon his dad while he was uh, naked and drunk in the tent. And he was, uh, Ham or Canaan was cursed. And it says, slave of slaves would Canaan be to his two brothers, Japheth and Shem. And Japheth and Shem were to rule over uh, Canaan. But they were also to, to separate according to their language and their tribe and their nation. And somebody was to rule in those nations. And that authority to rule came from Adam. And we can get misled thinking the divine right of king to come from God. No, it came, yes, it comes from God, but through Adam. God didn't say, uh, Adam, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of Satan and eaten of the fruit. No, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. Now, it was Satan who put the false ideas into Eve. So he was really yielding to Satan. But God says, because you listen to your wife. So authority is mediated. So the divine right of kings comes through Adam. That was the argument. And once we eliminated Adam, the whole idea of divine right of kings looked absurd to us. You know, well, how could you claim it coming from God? Well, they, they, because they eliminated Adam and it became hard to understand. So... Um, he concludes here on Adam, and he says, uh, blasting uh, um, Price, and he says, as this notion is contrary to Scripture, so it is to reason. And on the show lately, we've been talking about Logos. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the word Logos can mean reason. For reason dictates that if the governing power came from the people, the people might, whenever they please, choose to disobey their governors um, and would have a right to do so. I conclude that whenever you and Dr. Price teach that the power of the governors originates from or is delegated by the governed, you sap the foundation of all government and indirectly bring in the lawless democracy, which a sacred historian describes where he says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man dead did that which was right in his own eyes. Um, so over and over again, this idea that authority comes from the consent of the governed, uh, Fletcher says, is so wrong and so destructive that uh, he, he uses uh, this, uh, here's, this is a startling example. And he goes through, uh, and he goes into Milton's Paradise Lost, and he takes the argument that Satan had to persuade the angels. It was, a, you know, the Satan's argument of freedom and slavery. And he says, this seditious sophism is sufficient to fill us with a just detestation of Dr. Price's politics but a scheme which has a direct tendency so to level authority as to subvert all government and abolish all subordination in the universe. Such a scheme, I say, cannot be too strongly opposed. It should be totally extirpated. Archimedes said once, give me a point on which I may fix my engine and I will move the earth out of its place. And I may say, give me Dr. Price's political principles and I will move all kings out of their thrones and all subjection out of the world. To convince you of the truth of this assertion, I need only work a moment his patriotic engine in your presence. And he goes on and gives some more examples. But he basically says um, that it will, it will destroy all subordination. Wives to husbands, 
slaves to masters, children to parents, subjects to government. It will turn it all on its head, which is what we're seeing. Um, now, I've been saying this for the longest time, even back probably around um, the year 2000. I, uh, we, we've been uh, doing public access here for the longest time. I got into public access because I had a friend, public access television. I had a friend that uh, had a big library of VHS tapes in the 80s, and he would uh, put stuff on uh, the public access channel here in South Bend. And he asked me when he had a 15 minute empty clip, if I would just talk, he would get his camera and film me and I would talk so he, he wouldn't have blank space. So from that, I discovered, well, I could have my own show and I put my own tapes on. And then I thought, well, why don't I just talk the whole time? Because some of these tapes were just saying the same thing. So I started getting on public access and then I started uh, looking at the, fa the Founding Fathers. I, I assumed the Founding Fathers were Christian. I was putting David Barton stuff on. And then I started going, hold it here. These uh, the Constitution does not acknowledge God. I mean, this is serious stuff. I mean, the, the American experiment, the first time ever, the, the, the supreme law of the land does not acknowledge God or his law. The states did. So there was no great danger. But when Lincoln won the Civil War, the state constitutions were basically obliterated. And the federal constitution, which purposely does not acknowledge God, started ruling over everything. And then I, uh, I started jumping into the faith of our southern fathers because I'd say, wow, they kind of understood this. Because as soon as the South seceded, they put God back in their constitution. They saw that as the fundamental problem. And not only that, halfway through the Civil War in the North, they got scared and they made a strong movement to try to amend the Constitution to put God back in. Because they believed that the war was a consequence of failing to acknowledge God according to Romans 1. You can look at the, at the Reform movement in the North and, and study that yourself. Now, I'm going to show here just a, a three-minute little clip of, I found we did not uh, keep a record um, of those shows in the past, except we do have some VHS tapes that we're going to uh, pull out and try to go through. Um, but I did find a three minute little clip, and you can get a flavor of what I was going at on faith of our southern fathers, which later became uh, from such withdrawal, 1 Timothy chapter 6. So I'll show you that clip. Let's, uh, let's review what, what's being shown there. And, um, and we'll see how that ties in to Fletcher's argument that this will destroy all relationships. And where it says in Malachi uh, chapter 1, verse 6, if I'm the master, where's my fear? The king, where's, where, where's my fear? The slave master, where's my fear from the slave? The husband, where's my fear? The parents, where's my fear? All of them were requiring Fear. Children are to fear their parents. Wives are to fear their husbands. The slave is to fear the master, and we're to fear the king. It says that in scripture. That was destroyed. We actually said they're supposed to fear us. The government's supposed to fear us. That's that's our position. The government's supposed to fear us. Well, then the wives picked it up. They say, well, the husbands are supposed to fear us. So everything's reversed. Was it a Masonic uh, experiment? Hmm. You decide. So watch this three minutes clip and then we'll jump into uh, what I'm talking about there. Because he says, slaves must obey their masses or that the name of God and his doctrine will be, would be blasphemed. And then he says, if you have a believing master, uh, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Okay, so you were to consider the master faithful and beloved. And then he says, if any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words. It's the same word for sound, sound words. It says, uh, teach the things that become sound doctrines. It's the same words where we get the word wholesome, healthy. It's actually the Greek word healthy. Uh, if, you, if you teach otherwise, you consent not to the words of Jesus Christ and to the doctrine, which is according to godliness. Now, what is according to godliness? 
Slaves, obey your masters as unto Christ. Consider them worthy of all honor. That is godliness. And then he says in Titus, to put this all together, speak thou the things that become sound doctrine. And he says, slaves, obey your masters, uh, that, they, that, that you may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. And then immediately says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, etc. But he says, slaves, obey your masters, that, the, that, the, that you may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. And he says, now, if you, Paul says, if you don't obey your master, the, the name of God and his doctrine will be blasphemed. Okay, so you're, it's very clear here that Paul is focusing extremely detail on this relationship of slave to master. So that for 1,860 years, the church never wiggled. The devil could not wiggle the church out of that position. Couldn't move it because the scriptures were so clear at every point. If there was any belief in the word of God, there was no way that a notion could arise that the idea that uh, the slave-master relationship was in any way sinful. And that's why America, I believe, is extremely evil. In that we're the first people to do this and override these scriptures completely. And, uh, and we have God as our enemy because he is his word. And once you violate his word, you become an enemy. And that's why it says in 2 John, it says, um, everyone who does not abide in the teaching of Christ, but goes beyond it. On this clip, what you were watching there was 1 Timothy chapter 6. And I close with um, 2 John. And 2 John says, as you saw there, I'm going to read the context here. Verse 7, 2 John, epistle. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is, a, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. It's very self-explanatory. Now that part that I was reading there from a show back, could have been 2002, um, I, didn't, I didn't start, uh, like I changed the show to Israel, but that was later on. I didn't discover uh, the, how wrong Christian Zionism was or dispensational it was. I was working, actually I was the assistant chaplain of the jail and then I became the chaplain here in the St. Joe County Jail, and it just so happened. And I was in charge of the library also, and there was a book somebody donated on Israel by Ted Pike. And I'm going, whoa, I, I had never heard this argument that Israel and the, that the Jewish people were, you know, that what we were taught in evangelical, dispensational churches, what everybody on the radio and everybody on TV always said, they're God's chosen people and they should be our main ally and we should always support Israel. Well, Ted Pike turned my eyes around. Um, but that became Israel eventually. That's why I, I said I had the show here. But before that, I had uh, Faith of Our Fathers, Faith of Our Southern Fathers, which turned into From Such Withdraw. And I spent a lot of time uh, especially uh, from such withdrawal, and some of you have seen. Uh, there's a show you can find it on the YouTube with and with uh, E. Michael Jones, when he was kicked out of. Uh, he was forbidden uh, from holding his class at Little Flower Catholic Church here in South Bend. Uh, when the rabbis found out he was going to teach on his new book, The Jewish Revolutionary Spirit. Um, the rabbis told Little Flower Church that they, they were not going to allow him to have that course. So then he, he came on the show, uh, and it was a two-hour show, and you can see it was called From Such Withdrawal, but before that it was called Faith of Our Southern Fathers. And I did a lot 
on the Southern's argument justifying why they seceded. And soon after that, I, I, I started bringing in their, the South's big blind spot, that they couldn't hold on to the principles of the revolution, which hated slavery of any kind. The idea that you have to pay taxes was slavery to them. And the British said, well, if, if you hold these ideas of freedom, how can you keep the African Americans uh, in slavery? Totally inconsistent. And of course, Lincoln was right, in a way, to make it consistent. So the, the, you know, the war against slavery by the North was consistent to the principles of the American Revolution. So the South, the South was caught. They wanted to kind of hold on to those principles and then hold on. And you see that in the St. Andrew's flag. St. Andrew was uh, the patron saint of Scotland. And he was crucified sideways. And so the Southern Cross is St. Andrew's. So they're holding on to the principles of St. Andrew, Christianity. And then they're holding on to the principles of the American Declaration of Independence. Even though they put God back in the Constitution, well, they didn't put Jesus Christ back in. So they were still going only halfway. Now, the greatest theologian... Um, in America at that time uh, of the American Civil War uh, was um, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> Robert Louis Dabney. And we're going to have to do this on another show, and I'll, I'll give the argument um, that you're going to see on this little that, that clip you saw. Uh, we're going to go into Dabney's argument uh, why overturning the slave-master relationship was radically revolutionary. But they had to overturn it because it was consistent to the principles of the American Revolution. But Dabney argued that the, the, um, the position that the South held on slavery, which John Henry Hopkins, who was the head of the whole Episcopal Church, he said, you're overthrowing something that was in place for 1,850 years, uncontested, now overthrown. What's that going to do to marriage? It would destroy marriage because now the wives will not call their husband's master, let alone fear him. So now we have marriage destroyed. And that's the dilemma we're in. So the message here is we need to repent and we need to line up with Scripture and we need to confess the, faith of our, the, the sins of our fathers. So this is Peter Halland on the show Israel.